The Week in Review, a podcast for clinicians, by clinicians, all on the path to clinical mastery and having a hell of a time along the way. Episode 24, 25. 25. How's it sound? You know what's better than 24? 25. Not if you're playing golf. Um, <laughs> so if you notice, this is extremely fancy. Hopefully it sounds better than it has. I Daniel think. is not that much taller than me. He just won't lower his seat. So when he speaks into the microphone, he's going to have to get small. Debatable. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we got our audio engineer down here that's working on it. Uh, his name is Muchacho, and that's what he's drinking. Um, I'm doing a flyer of a case. I had a case written up. And then Tanner and I saw a follow-up from today, and it was actually a much more interesting case. So um, may not have all the detail. I do have the details, but it's not written up pretty, so hopefully I can recall it pretty well. Um, any, like, follow-ups from previous cases that you can think of before we get rolling? Nah, my dude's doing good. My dude. <laughs> Don't know which one. Just it's doing good. For the last one. Bilateral oh. hamstring pain. Oh, another runner? Yeah. He raced well last weekend. There you go. His dude's doing good. That's your, that's your yeah. detailed update. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, so this is a guy that I haven't seen for a few years. He uh, came in Monday of this week. And if I could find out how to get to his chart on my iPad, that'd be fantastic. Um, but he, I haven't seen him for a long time. Last time I did see him, I was working on kind of bilateral posterior shoulder pain uh the guy's general presentation is kind of here like mild kyphosis ct junction uh the very first time i ever saw him i actually sent him for an x-ray for as because he was that stiff he was at the time 32 years old uh fairly healthy overall but just really stiff thoracic spine mild kyphosis there ct junction kind of whatever you want to call it downwinders hump um and his actual overhead flexion, if you're watching on camera, is probably 120 degrees, 130 degrees before he has to just get into his lumbar spine. It's just fixed. Uh, complaint this time is acute low back pain because he went back to the gym to work out. I don't know how many sit-ups they did, but a bunch of sit-ups of something else. And he goes, like, towards the end of that workout and into the night, I was having acute low back pain, spasms. Uh, and that's his presentation on the 26th. So that was three days ago. So that was Tuesday. Uh so we'll just kind of read through this note. Uh, said he's having some radiating pain down his right leg, which is intermittent, um, positional activity based. He notes that that was quite a bit worse when it first started, um, that it was all the way down to his foot. Now that's kind of retracted a little bit. But then he also notes that he has tingling in both feet um, out in his toes. So it's not his whole foot, just out in kind of his toes. He also says it's hard for me to tell because it's tingling. I don't know if it's my whole foot or whatever. Uh <laughs> we're going through the rest of the exam. I'm kind of skipping ahead here. And then like, we're literally about ready to start treating. He goes, and I kind of have like numbness tingling in all my fingers. And I was like, Oh, okay. So then I end up doing some different tests because of that as we go through this. Uh, and he also notes that he's been taking some ibuprofen to help with the back pain. It really doesn't help that much. Uh, side note on this, his wife is an OB. Uh, so pretty educated on this stuff. So when he has back pain or he's talking about numbness, tingling his hands, he's getting some information elsewhere as well. Uh, he's in like a four out of 10 pain. Uh, he's not really having a whole lot of pain at night. It's more if he sits for a long time, he's afraid to work out. Uh, so he hasn't been back in the gym, but it's bending forward, sitting for long periods of times, so things like that. But the numbness is kind of like not really pinned down to anything in particular, just comes and goes, or it's just kind of there. And I think he's not aware that it's there all the time. Uh, he works for a, um, uh, mission-based ministry. So he's getting ready to go to Malaysia for, I don't know, a couple weeks or multiple months. And he literally leaves, not this week, but the end of next week. So I was like, okay. Uh, movement wise, I'm going to be honest. We didn't do a top tier analysis, uh, because when this guy bends over to touch his toes, he ain't going nowhere. It's not really pain. I mean, he has discomfort, but he's just stuck. He doesn't move well overall. So I'm just, I'm not going to get a whole lot of info off top tier with this guy. And that's just, I've seen him before. Uh, so we go right into palpation, as you can imagine, uh, mid T spine, severely restricted CT junction, you know, restricted overall rotation extension, uh, lumbar spine, like L5 S1 extension restriction, uh, positive orthopedic tests, straight leg raise on the right. Right. And we hit literally probably, uh, 
a neurologic wall from tension on both sides around 70 degrees max. He hits pain in the first visit about 50 degrees, and then it's just the whole rest of the way through. And I'll kind of talk about that here in a second. So a straight leg raise, active straight leg raise, and then slump was slightly positive, but that was just kind of discomfort in his low back, no radiation into his legs. All uh, neuro, I mean, we did everything neurologic with this upper and lower numbness tingling. Everything was normal. Reflex is normal. Cranial nerves, normal. Strength, everything was normal, right? Um, he did kind of, when we started testing for all that, I did, you know, tell him, hey, I'm testing for this stuff just to be, you know, sure of any of that. Your wife's an MD. I'm sure she's talked about this stuff and you'll see what I explained to him as we go through this. I just kind of explained the mechanics of it. And then we, that's why we did this case because what we did today kind of proved that to him and us a little further. Um, so we kind of go right into typical treatment for somebody that has uh, extension based restriction with flexion intolerant low back pain. Uh, we go on to, you know, McKinsey kind of extension based uh, process. Well, this guy doesn't move through his mid T spine. Um, so when he, and his hips are a little bit stiff. So when he lifts up, it's like, he's just doing a plank. I mean, just his whole body is moving. Um, so we're going through it. No pain while he's doing extensions. He does a set. Then we start applying overpressure. We do three sets of uh, 10, two of those with overpressure. We retest straight leg raise. It's, I don't know, 10, 15 degrees, uh, more range of motion, still a little bit of pain just in his low back at the top of that range of motion. Like, okay. Um, so then go through, we adjust everything, mid low back or mid back, low back. Uh, we do some dead bug stuff, breathing, go back to that. Kind of honestly left it there for the first day. And I just said, hey, for the next 48 hours, you got to go crazy. We have probably three visits before we leave from Malaysia. Let's try to hit it hard for two days, come back in, do some more stability based stuff. And I even said towards the end of that first visit, I said, we're just trying to cut down on symptoms. We have to go back to your mid T-spine extension stuff right, like right away next visit. So he comes in, he says, yeah, I'm doing maybe a little bit better. It's just not as severe. Um, nothing in his legs almost at all. He's like, it's basically just slow back pain. Um, but then he voices again, Hey, my wife made me go to my primary care, get blood work. I was like, no, nah, I'm not opposed to that. I told him, I hope they run certain labs like B12 CRP. Um, you know, just some general stuff since he's having numbness tingling, hopefully we'll see. But in my opinion, nothing was red flag. He had nothing in his history, no pain at night. He's not losing weight. I mean, nothing that makes me worried for him at all. Um, no vision changes, all the things we're thinking about from, you know, progressive neurodegenerative diseases to, you know, something really bad. Um, the way I explained it the first visit to him is, if you can imagine, he was doing a ton of sit-ups. And this is part of the takeaway because we want to start doing kind of a clinical pearls here is the history is always kind of leading you a certain way on your exam, but also treatment that, uh, if he's sitting there doing sit-ups and his mid back is in a kyphotic position, I mean, he's only got two options to move from that's his neck and his lumbar spine. So it's like, you're trying to tug on his spinal cord at two ends and it's just not going to move in the middle, which we know is kind of like a onset of a nerve traction injury, right? Or a setup for it. So when I kind of explained that to him, I, you know, I don't know if that calmed him down or not, but that's what I was trying to explain. Like you can get, you know, upper and lower just from tractioning on both ends of it. So this visit, he comes back in today. We say, how are you doing? A little bit better. Okay, well, let's check out some different stuff. So we palpate, and then the very first thing we go to is what? C-spine retraction extension. So I had Tanner do that. Very first thing, we test a straight leg raise, still positive, but it was transitional. So he had hit a point of pain, and then he could go past it, right? So we're just kind of seeing that, like, maybe there's not as much neural tension as there is kind of maybe an actual uh, dynamic scenario there. So we just do, uh, how many did you do? 10, 15? Yeah, 15, good yeah. end range, yeah. So 15 end range cervical retractions, retest straight leg raise, quite a bit better. He's like, oh. So I think that kind of opened his eyes. Mm -hmm. Then Tanner adjusts, you know, upper thoracic spine, CT junction. Um, we do we do a little bit of dead bug stuff. And the wall upriding? Yeah, and then thoracic uh, spine wall uprighting. So that's basically you're in a dead bug, trying to go overhead. And again, this guy can get maybe 120 degrees and you can tell it is very hard for him. I mean, he is stuck here, like, you know, really kyphosis CT junction. Um, so I was like, Hey, when you're doing this stuff, your biggest goal is here. So we pull out a foam roller, teach him to kind of put himself in retraction and just actively work mid thoracic spine and kind of a McKinsey model on a foam roller. 
And the second rep of that, it just zings his low back. And he's like, oh, he goes, oh, my back spasm. And you could tell he wanted to bail. He was very raw foam roll. like, no, no, no. It's like, that's perfect. Like you just proved to yourself that it's not necessarily your low back. We're moving your mid back, right? Or we're kind of putting you in, in range, um, retraction your neck. Uh, load him up there. He does a full 10 to 12 reps. Uh, stand back up, try to do wall uprighting one more time, really focus on his neck, go back in straight leg raise, almost like perfect. And he's like, Oh, like, so like now we're getting to management of your issue. And I said, Hey, we're going to go home with what T spine foam rolling, but more, you know, just kind of active levering into extension over that wall uprighting and stuff you can do at the office. And then you're still using a dead bug because that's kind of the active component of that. Uh, but even at the end, still voiced like a little, you know, well, I'm still kind of worried about this, but you can tell he was like kind of coming out of it. So the reason I want to bring this one up is, uh, literally it was the last thing he said before I started treatment the first day. He was like, yeah, my hands are kind of numb. And I was like, oh, God, like couldn't bring that. Like I should ask more questions, I guess, but I'd seen him in the past. He's got low back pain, started working out. So that made me do a bunch of tests and then I had to rule in and rule out. What do I think that's something that is clinically necessitating me to do anything else? Imaging, you know, referral. No. He gets it on his own. It'd be pretty cool to see, like, is everything normal or do his symptoms uh, subside by working on his T-spine and both his hands and feet? We'll just kind of have to see on that. Um, but like I said, the clinical pearl is there, like, be focused on the main functional audit and the main treatment focus instead of just where their pain is because we could treat him. I mean, he responded to extensions. He was better, right, for his lumbar spine. He, there's no way he's extending in his mid thoracic spine doing a Cobra. I mean, just that ain't, he's, that's not accessible. Um, so I did that just because that's the easy play for pain relief instead of kind of, he's like, I got low back pain. Why am I rolling my mid back? Um, but now moving forward, it's just like, okay, we're all over it. Cause we talk about that a lot in the office of like, pick that big thing, try not to be too worried about if they're not perfect and just kind of see if it actually changes or not. So it's a cool one for me to, you know, 10 years in practice, you're still like, all right, if I'm on that spot, like, you know, this one created pain and then reduced pain working. So it was like, it proves it. That's not always going to be the case. You're not going to see immediate relief of pain. You're going to recreate symptoms working in that area. But every once in a while you do that and it's kind of a little like, you know, I don't know, check mark of like, oh, you're on the right track. Um, did I miss anything on that? Make sure to grab the mic if you're going to. I think I kind of hit it all. Yeah, I think I think you pretty much hit it all. And yeah, I think a big moment, like Bo was saying already, is when we were doing the T-spine rolling, I think a big like realization was when he's literally working on like T4 area and it just lights up his back. Like that was like a big moment, I feel like for him, that just really clicked. And again, maybe he was moving through his low back because I don't like not saying that he was getting extension was causing it was just like that was perturbing it, which I think was eye opening for him. Um, didn't make you feel any better. The fact that he was already getting labs. Yeah. Well, I'm just interested. We've talked how like Pavel Kolaj, you know, gets labs, MRIs, all stuff. It's cool if we get all that stuff on every patient, because I think there, I even said today, I kind of, I didn't say dish, but I remember way back when very first visit with him, I sent him for x-rays for AS. Mm -hmm. Um, he was at that time also, you also got to think about his posture, having some headaches, this shoulder stuff. So I sent him for that. But then I was kind of explaining, you know, hey, there's these big ligaments on both sides of your spine. Sometimes they kind of stiffen up, like, you know, if you let toothpaste out of the tube. Um, and I think I even said, like, that's kind of an autoimmune component. So I'm kind of glad you got labs because we can start exploring that. So let's say he pops positive for, like, high CRP. I don't know what they're going to test for, right? Um, but yeah, I wish I could, like, order stuff for everybody. Right. As soon as I know, I'm like, Hey, ESR, CRP, HLAB 27, rheumatoid factor. Just see if anything's in there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just cause I'm curious and you'd pick up patterns. Mm -hmm. Somebody's fairly healthy. They're working out and you're like, Oh, I thought it could be. And Oh, it is true with him. So I got to make sure I check with that person next time. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll be doing more of that because if like Dr. Hyman's show, Rupa health wants to sponsor this content, <laughs> this uh, podcast, um, labs are super cheap and I think we'll be able to get more patients, more labs more often. So that'd be cool. Yeah. Then on the first visit too, what I was thinking is, did you play around just because you knew there was some, well, after you found out about the hands, mm -hmm. you could play around with like head position when you were just testing straight leg raise and. Well, actually that is something we missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good call. So we did uh, supine flossing with cervical extension mm -hmm. as we were kind of going through straight leg raise. Yeah. And he had no pain on straight leg raise as he went into cervical extension. Cool. 
which even so good call, he even has a hard time just like getting into cerebral book since he's so kyphos. Yeah. So he literally goes here and I'm like, no, let your head fall. And, and he's just stuck. That's really a call. We didn't do, we use that as a test, right? Like mm -hmm. retract into there, but the retractions are the home run today. Just mm -hmm. hit it. And you could do those forever with that guy. Well, I feel like it makes you I'm not saying it rolls out completely, but feel a little bit better about brain. Yeah. And like other things. Yeah. But and again, he could, he could have two things going on. He could have, who's to say he doesn't have a tonsillar, you know, cyst or something and we can still like move a spinal cord around because that's the thing you got to be careful with on these things is like you do get pain relief you do change symptoms and then you got to check some stuff sometimes so again if that guy came back every visit the same and we can do in office change two three visits instead of like four to six with this kind of stuff mri for sure now the question there is how do you know where you're getting the mri are you getting lumbar spine because he's got lumbar spine pain? Are you doing a cervical MRI because he's got this, you know, kyphosis? Are you doing brain image? I don't know. That's where you got neuro look good. Yeah, no, nothing whatsoever. I mean, we tested upper motor neuron lesions, DTRs, myotome, dermatome, cranial nerves. Everything was peachy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, I had a case earlier this year where the, the neuro got the MRI of his low back, mm -hmm. and I was like, Cause he was having trouble going to the bathroom so i yeah. got the image of his neck and it was like his neck is what they ended up operating on mm -hmm. and if i was going to pull a trigger on mri it'd be his neck right i mean because i would think something like a syrinx or some sort of you know space occupying lesion around there um that would be my guess mm -hmm. uh, but yeah especially with symptom change in his lumbar spine cool yeah any other questions on that one you said you've been seeing him for a long time well i saw him he wasn't in jane so i haven't seen him for probably at least four years He's always been this stiff. Yeah. So that's why very first visit he came in for bilateral posterior shoulder pain. Cause he was going to like a CrossFit kind of mm -hmm. the gym that shall not be named. Um, he's just getting torched. <laughs> and at that time I was working out in there and I'd mm -hmm. seen this guy working out and you're kind of like, I know why your shoulders are getting torched. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we worked and worked and worked and he got it, but you also knew like this is going to take a long time to change. And yeah. he's still trying to go into the gym mm -hmm. the next day or whatever and do this stuff. Um, he did get better, but you can tell, like, I mean, whatever we did, A, he's not doing, didn't make, make enough change. Actually. So yeah, is that the same as it was then? Same, if not worse. Yeah. yeah. But he also hasn't worked out for, I think at least a year and just oh, jumped I thought back. you were saying it was like, just since he, oh, okay. The yeah. He just were... got back into yeah. working out. That was his, he'd been working out for three weeks. Yeah. Did a workout with a lot of sit-ups later that night, started having his pain, woke up pretty bad. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm trying to think of anything else is in terms of clinical pearls on that one. Yeah. Classic lumbar spine case, but not really not. Mm -hmm. Right. Still responds to all that stuff. You got to kind of go upstream a little bit. So that's why I thought it was cool. Yeah. I'll save my other case for some other time. Yeah. I got a bank now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> now I'm good. Well, now I'll get more follow ups too with that case. So we'll be able to see a little trajectory, which would be cool. Well, he'll, you said he'll be gone. Well, no, you, you have. Follow-ups for the other case, the pocket oh, okay. case. I'll get probably two more visits on that one, so I'll have a better trajectory. Gotcha. Now you're up. Well, <sighs> if you guys want to get just a little bit closer to the mic. Which mic? Oh, this mic? Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> That's mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I had a very busy two last days, so we're going to talk about a case we already talked about, but they haven't heard it, so... Um, we have a high school female runner. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't treat just runners in here, but apparently it's the middle of cross country season. Everybody's getting hurt. Um, so this is a pretty competitive high school runner. Her, when we first started talking on her first day, I've treated her dad before and both of her parents ran in college. She wants to run at their college. She's a junior in high school right now. Um, she wants to run under 18 minutes for 5k this year. So pretty competitive. What's she at right now? She's around 1834. Um, she started having right medial knee pain a uh, week before she started seeing me, which was September 15th. And she noticed it uh, during easy days and faster runs, but more so during faster runs. Uh, she had had a race the weekend before, and that was what really kind of when she first noticed the pain there. Um, so... Just looking at this girl overall, Tanner was with me as well. Um, she's very, I mean, runners are not big. She's on the smaller end of high school female runners. 
uh, probably, well, we'll bust the bubble. We did some carrying tests, which required me to ask what her weight was. Is she on the quieter end as well? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> Where that was going. But no. okay. girl, doesn't, girl doesn't talk. That's, yeah. Well, I feel like all all the high school female runners that I have right now, none of them talk. Yeah. They're just... Welcome to running. Yeah. <laughs> they come They come in stone cold. <laughs> they do. They really are. What the you answers... Ask, what'd you ask one the other day? Didn't somebody just like stone, like... They're always... It's just one and she's just like, no. Yeah, it hurts. Not any better. Yeah. So like, just, just really what, sure. What brings you in? My ankle hurts when I run. My ankle hurts when I run. Then the attitude stare. Yep, yeah. yeah, just blank stare. Yeah, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, but this girl's friendly. She's 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 nice. Um, so top tier SFMA. Everything functional, non painful, except for multi signal extension. So lots of range of motion on extension. I marked it dysfunctional just because she didn't share the extension through T spine. Um, but she still she leans way back. Mm-hmm. Then, obviously, like I said, ranges of motion, all of them are really good. There's nothing that's really that limited. Uh, her pain in her right knee is on flexion. Day one, I'm just supine, checking knee flexion, pain there. The only ortho that was positive, Thessaly's, and neuro was fine. <laughs> neuro was all normal. Wait, did she have full knee flexion? She had full knee flexion, yeah. Um, also, this is important for later, but pain and knee flexion prone and supine. Uh, and then again, both go all the way. Like she's, I mean, heel to backside, no, no restriction there at all. Um, looked at her, Bo had seen her previously and it kind of alluded to me that she had, they had dealt with some things, lower extremity that were all kind of coming from her lumbar spine. I didn't really look at those notes cause I didn't want to be biased. And so I'm checking her ability to create intradominal pressure in a supine position and not great which is not uncommon for runners. Doesn't mean that that's a good thing, but uh, she also could not create a uh, fixed point at TL junction in that supine position. So thus far, all that I tested, pain audits were Thessaly and then knee flexion, and then that ability for her to create the fixed point at TL was the thing that I was monitoring functionally. Um, all in that first visit, we... I can't remember if I actually took her through. I didn't load anything at the spine in range because, like I said, she was she was really mobile. Um, so I went to we worked on the breathing for a little bit, a little while, in the supine position, which made her symptoms a little bit better down in her knee. Then at that point, it was getting close to the end of the visit. I was like, okay, I always know that we can go back to dermal traction over that area if that's going to be if I think it's saphenous nerve. So I cut the area. We were going through a lateral lunge that also made her pain a lot better. Um, still had some inflection in on Thessaly's, but a lot better. So sent her home with that and the breathing. Second visit, uh, and then they, you guys can kind of like chime in wherever, however, <laughs> she probably chimed in on it. Um, the second visit, I am mainly still working on the TL, punctum, fixum, all that being able to create stability. And now we're in a higher position. Um, so she comes in and we're working, we went through hang stance and just a half kneeling um, hover, which she had decent stability. And I was comparing to previous kind of a similar medial knee pain, uh, high school female runner who immediately when I put her in that split squat, she started shaking. This girl was doing pretty good. Now she's a pretty high level runner as well. So, um, she only has the knee pain in flexion on pr in prone now. So supine, no pain when I flex her knee, but then when we put her prone, that lights it up. And then also when we were doing the split squat hover, when the right leg was back, right? So when that was the, the trail leg, um, so at this point as well, in the supine position, she's already doing better at being able to create the fixed point at TL junction, uh, which I was kind of surprised. I didn't think it was going to change that quickly. Third visit, Daniel and I had talked about checking to see if there was any sort of um, 
closing component to her when she's running if she's creating compression around the left side in her low back. Um, so to check out a, a static opener, which didn't necessarily change the pain audits. Um, but, and Bo and I had been talking about, you know, if saphenous nerve is the thing that we think is being aggravated, it has to have a second point around which there's an entrapment or it's being pulled from. So higher up in that lumbar spine, if she's getting compression when she's running, if she's just falling into extension a lot. Um, so then I checked through the adductors to see if there was any trigger points, which again, we talked about, and I learned something new this week with trigger points, like trigger point versus tone. She doesn't lack range of motion in the area or at least in her hip, right? So the things that could limit range of motion or a trigger point would have to limit range of motion. Whereas the tone isn't necessarily going to be the same. Mm -hmm. I guess tongue can still limit range of motion, but we just were saying if a trigger point exists in a muscle that crosses a joint, it has to restrict range of motion. Right. Yeah. But that right. would be the because, same tone. Right. And because she doesn't, well, the adductors don't cross the knee joint. That's why we were saying, mm -hmm. right. So that's why it was, that's why I checked those out. Right. So on that right side, on that right side, much more tone and like tenderness. I mean, I'm, I'm pressing on the adductors and she is jumping initially. Um, it's not reproducing the right knee pain, but it's, it's really tender on her. Um, so we go through a sideline open book position, just breathing and rolling over that right hip. Um, and that tone obviously gets a little bit better. And I send her home with that. That's what I'm, I'm also adding in to start working on. At this point, she's also run three miles easy before she starts to have any pain. Um, she's kind of going... I left a piece out from the first visit. I saw her on a Friday afternoon. Saturday morning, she decided to go for a, a run, an easy short run, try some strides, and then tried to race that night, which she had asked me what, what I thought she should do. Um, I told her, I was like, hey, can't tell you what to do, but if I were you, I would give this a little bit more time to try to work on some things since we've only you know, I've seen you one time. And the race that was going on that weekend was not, it wasn't a championship race, it wasn't a county meet. It was just an invitational. Mm -hmm. um, but I said it was up to you. So she decided to race. And, you know, no surprise, it was not It was not great. So she, she dropped like halfway through the race. <laughs> and then that's kind of been a common theme until we talked about that more over the trial of care. She, she would want to try to push things. And I was like, hey, did, we have to be able to allow this to calm down a little bit while we're working on stuff. That doesn't mean you can't run. But I would say try to run easy, take a day off between doing an elliptical or bike, whichever you, you prefer. And then, well, since faster stuff is what bothers you, we'll slowly reintroduce that. So now she's at the point where she's running easy and she's doing okay with that. It's just the faster stuff that still bothers her. So fourth visit, um, we're still working down the adductor <coughs> side of things. Uh, the tone has improved across visits, so not just like in the last visit. Um, we worked through a lateral lunge with a slide plate and then a Copenhagen adduction on that side. And again, she tried like some strides or something in addition to the easy runs that week and it was still kind of bothering her on, on the strides. Then I don't have, I'm kind of looking at our notes that we wrote down on the board here because I saw her once since then or I guess I saw her the next time after we all convened and talked. And this is where the carrying comes in. So we were talking about if stability is her big thing that it seems like I kind of ditched early because I tried to move to the adductor quicker than I should have let the us working on stability go longer before I went to a higher position and then changed directions. Um, so to test her ability to endure stability and hold that for longer. We went with the um, FCS, just the carrying endurance test. So we took 75% of her body weight, split it in two hands. So we just had her hold 35 pound kettlebells and walking um, just down the parking lot. So she was able to hold the, the kettlebells for a minute and a half, but was not able to maintain just a normal upright posture. She started to kind of slouch slump as, the, as she was carrying it. Um, and the kettlebells were kind of carrying her. She started walking down the, the driveway. Um, 
so we got back and we started talking about how that was kind of representative of how when she is running, she does better at the beginning, slowly, which is most runners, like slowly as they get into the run, mechanics are going to break down just as you get tired. And that, that point is different for everybody and it's dependent on how fast you're running, all of a bunch of different factors. But for her, we used a carry, so we used a suitcase carry in here right after that. And we loaded up, so right side, we loaded up her left hand with less weight than that, like 20 or 25 pounds. Had her walking up and down the hallway, making sure that she could stay in that upright position, using her other hand to cue intra-abdominal pressure on the right side. And she had no, no pain or need doing that, and it was all good. And I said, hey, this is something that we can cook into a workout for you so that you're building time, being able to maintain this, this stable position. So don't pick a weight that pulls you over and don't go long enough that it pulls you over. So that was the last time we saw her. She had been doing better and she's gonna try a workout this week. So she had like a three and a half or four mile run, didn't have any pain. She's gonna try a workout before I see her next um, and then try to race next weekend. So that's what we got. A lot there. Yeah. Um, at any point <clears throat> during that, so I know that an FMS is kind of looked at like for us and a lot of people like an exit, you know, screen, I guess. At any point during that, do you feel like you could go, okay, like top your estimate is pretty good. And once I said, well, extension's not great. Like, did you go back to that? Is that still not great the extension? Yeah. I didn't check it every time. Um, I think I checked it like the second visit and it's still yeah. the same, but, um, Cause like an FMS could be, you know, obviously Alex said like a, that carries an FCS. So it's like SFMA, FMS, FCS would be there. Like, mm. do you feel like you could have thrown her an F and FMS and something would have broke down there before just loading her up? Yeah. Yeah. I bet rotary stability wouldn't be good. Which kind of puts you back in the same, yeah. like unilateral carry, mm -hmm. maybe lower level kind of same stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just curious if like, cause what we kind of talked about in here, like, Alex wrote this whole trajectory out on the board the other day. We were kind of talking about like sticking with the main focus, which was kind of, you know, why I was bringing up my case, like get on something and stick with it. But at the same time, it was kind of like, well, if you see stuff getting better, then you kind of have to go higher echelon testing. So I just wondered if like, maybe we even think like, okay, like somebody's been really good. Like, well, what do you do now? Is mm -hmm. it just specific sport specific stuff there they you know, have, paint in a clean so you mimic that or do you go yeah. to a more standardized thing um because we talked about maybe taking a lot of these runners and doing a couple of the fcs tests or yeah. kind of grabbing it some and just doing them across the board to see what everybody fails at yeah. for a lot of reasons um so yeah i was just kind of wondering if maybe we like you see somebody getting really good and you're like hey we always try to do an fms see mm -hmm. if something else comes out or do you do yeah. or do you go sport specific which running's kind of tough yeah it's kind of hard i i i basically because i wanted her and I actually did I did the same thing on the girl that I was talking about earlier that also mm -hmm. had right medial knee pain. Um, did that with her today. She fooled like a house of cards, didn't she? Oh, she didn't even make it thirty seconds. Yeah, right. And Rumpel she, Stiltskin. if you looked at the both of them, you would think she's probably more stable until you watch her run. Um, and she runs a lot slower than. What do you mean by that? What do you mean like she seems like she'd be more stable until she runs? So she's not as frail as the other girl, but. She, when you watch her run, the, the second girl, mm -hmm. she's kind of all over the place. Yeah. So right. motor control versus like body mass, muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was the motor control of this girl? Like when you, did you do other tests? The patient. Mm -hmm. the, Number one. Yeah. Uh, um, when you did your case on. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is how we don't compare. Um, sorry. Ask your question again. So like, did you do anything to test like motor control early on? Because it almost... Cause it's like, I don't, you said I mentioned openers. I don't remember, I don't remember mentioning openers for her, but it almost sounded to me like you weren't necessarily wrong per se day one. And you just jumped course. Yeah. So I was just like curious if you did any motor around it. So then you could say, Hey, Oh, now I don't have to do FCS cause I can see the motor behind it. Tell me this. Yeah. What would you Maybe do? Like a 90, 90, like, can I even control yeah. 90, 90 going down or, or like there. a cat cow? Since she's like mm -hmm. you're saying TL junction fixed yeah. point, like could she do that and like quadruped? Yeah. Which yeah. would also which also plays into rotary stability tests. It's almost like a requisite yeah. for that. 
Yeah. And I was thinking about it more as in like what, because yes, extensions out there, but that's not there for like a lot of runners. A lot of them mm -hmm. lack extension. So like to well, me, she has it. It's where she gets it from. Right. Or how she gets it. Yeah. It's not that I would have necessarily jumped there first, but just the fact that Saffiness nerve was relieved, mm -hmm. and then it's like I don't have Bo's history part. So then I'm thinking, okay, well if I can just get her up and control her hip, maybe I, mm. I decrease that if I, you know, tape that for a run. Mm. And then so maybe it's like if I just learn how to control the hip, and of course I can always throw a dead bug in there. But this is like me acting like I had the positives from day one, and then how do I build off of that? Unless it's like instead of just jumping ship too fast. Mm. Which I think at the end of the day, it still comes back to we and a lot of people maybe need a better standardization, right? Systemization of like, you're like, God, everything is really good, right? Yeah. Like pretty much. And then you're like, Ooh, the one thing that wasn't awesome is yeah. still getting better. And then you're like, well, what do I do next? And maybe it's not always like go back to palpation. I mean, mm. you know, as much as we would say, like, you know, Brett would say my goal is like to restore everybody to that kind of baby, like function would be the optimal goal, right? Like no trigger points, high tone, no joint restriction. Yeah. It's not realistic, but then we also think like motor control is ruling that, which gets to your point. So then it's like, FMS is a motor control thing, right? It's a couple mobility, mainly stability, and that's what motor control is synonymous with. And then you get an FCS, now you're loading and looking at the performance of which the backbone of mobility and stability are, you know, are needed or requisites. I think maybe we just kind of say, hey, if somebody's doing awesome at everything, which is what you do, right? It's why we screen somebody. Yeah. If they fell out of the medical SFMA, the next thing would be if you were a purist, FMS, you know, or I guess we could ask Colm what he would do. Um, yeah. It does get, it's not easy. And like I said, running is much harder than if somebody's like, dude, when I swing a golf club and I get yeah. to the, my backswing, I have pain. You're like, to me, that's easier mechanically because running is complex. Yeah. Not that golf yeah. isn't, but it's just, it's different. And you just don't, nobody ever is doing thousands of reps, like every training session, like, like with running, like they're going to be. Well, they might, but it's running. Like you said, like they have that aerobic passing endurance, like break point. Whereas golf, it may be literally like, like I get 10 swings in or it's right away. It's the same yeah. thing versus running. It's like mile two, it hits and then it's there and it doesn't yeah. go away or it just keeps getting worse. So it is like, and it's harder for us to replicate. test it because so That's many of them come in and it doesn't hurt. Right. Which is why I'm saying like, you got to be a sniper with function, mm -hmm. not just function. What we would say, like functional audits, trigger points, tone, joint range of motion, but function of like, how do they do those yeah. things? Which you know, art of assessment, I would say, hey, you have sport specific or movement specific testing, but then also runner screen, I tried to pull a bunch of stuff, or you could just say, yeah, I do an FMS when I'm kind of like, I don't know where to go. Nothing there, maybe you do go FCS. Because you're like, hey, they are passing that, or they say they score an 18 out of 21, you're like, that didn't give me much. And then yeah. you know, hey, higher order. You know, if somebody makes it all the way through there and they still have pain, maybe that's kind of like, yeah, this ain't good. <laughs> you know? Well, that, would that be the point that you looked at running? Yeah, because sports specificity would be at the top of that pyramid. Sports specificity, how they're doing that thing, or legit pathology. Yeah. Which I think you kind of ruled out through orthopedic testing. You can reduce pain pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. literally none of these, all three of these girls that have right me don't need pain. Mm -hmm. None of them have, one or two of them might have Thessaly's like the first day. And yeah. It's gone. Which is the one thing that we're not addressing, which is the other thing. These are teenage girls that are probably either just gone through puberty, are going through puberty, yeah. are going to school, probably don't sleep enough, don't eat right, awesome, and yeah. then we're worried about a little bit of medial knee pain. And it's like, you could probably go eat better and drink some water and you're probably yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> and one of them, it's been literally within the trial of care, it's gone from right knee to left knee yeah. to up the knee. Like it's like yeah. now medial thigh. So, so then we're always being like, ooh, that's a little back. And it's yeah. like, maybe she's just that pain because she's just not like killing everything else in her life. Yeah. So that's the, the, also the tough thing, especially with kids. I mean, we just did a functional med visit with a, you know, uh, guy runner in here, a 16 year old runner, and none of his seems musculoskeletal. It is not musculoskeletal at all. I mean, the parents know that now we know that and mm -hmm. it's, but as I said, I think you're gonna see a lot more of that coming down the line. Um, any questions on any of that stuff? No, I think it's like what we were talking about the other day. It's like chase the diagnosis, chase the assessment, not necessarily like sports performance necessarily yeah. right away. Yeah, which and is tough to do because that's where their pain's showing up. You yeah. want them to keep going. But if we want to do our job well, you can't like, that's no different than just chasing pain with a 
mom or dad like you know just being like yeah 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 i want to do this all like you can't just be like oh you gotta go play golf tomorrow like let's get you out of pain today i think it was easier for the girl that didn't she still moved well but her stability was way worse it was easier for me to say like oh mm -hmm. let's just i need to say the ship and work and work this because mm -hmm. you're not good at all these whereas the girl from the case today was mostly moved really well and could control a lot of things but then so yeah that's where i but who's to say too, I mean, you've been in the room with me when somebody comes in, eighth grader, freshman, unilateral, bilateral, shin, medial shin pain, and parents want me to treat him, kid wants to get out of pain, I'm like, nah, here, just keep going. But who's to say that like this girl is not just type A, it's just yeah. ramping up to cross country, having some knee pain, you literally, but you do your job, you test her out, you're like, dude, you actually move really well. Yeah, You can reproduce pain, but you're like... You know what I mean? So there might have been a decision that you could have, like, three visits in, you're like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to chase anything. I'm actually going to let you go. Yeah. And that's not what a lot of people want to hear, but sometimes you're like, mm -hmm. but I think that's, I mean, the runner, the case I was going to do today, like, legit tendon injury. And, like, we had to kind of reconcile, like, it's not going to be, or this is not going to be a magic bullet. Like, you're out of pain and you're racing this weekend pain-free. She still hit a PR, but she's like, it was pretty bad, you know, and was no worse, though, so still progressing. Yeah. But I was like, it's not going to be perfect for a couple of weeks versus, hey, you're actually fine. Go run through, which she has been that other kid too. Like, yeah, okay, go run through this pain because you're just adapting to more than you've done in the past. Hmm. But that's a tough call. And I mean, that just comes with time. But a lot of these kids are also snowflakes. So they need a little. Well, I think this girl is actually the kind of person that would literally run until something busted. Yeah, I agree. Also, from what I know, not the greatest at communicating what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which makes it not the easiest to suss out when you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Or it's hard to figure out. And then you're like, yeah. she's also not helping me out here at all. Yeah. That's not an easy one. Kids, man. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we, I actually didn't check. I should have checked. Uh, we're still, if you want a, us to present a case for you, uh, you can send that to my email, drbobeard at gmail.com. Come on with it. Shoot us some reviews. Uh, let us know if you'd want to hear about specific cases. I mean, we see anything and everything. We're just picking the ones that we think are interesting. So mm -hmm. um, we can do anything. Any closing words? Closing words of Espanol? Stay blessed. Thank you. <laughs> that was Spanish. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs>